My thesis for today's lecture is to talk about technology and architecture in the long 19th century. Some of the things that you have to keep in mind is that there were a lot of inventions, uh, industrial changes, technological changes that were going on in the middle of the 1800s. For instance, with the Impressionists, one of the things that seems to influence them is the manufacture of oil paint in uh, factories and being able to take the oil paint in these aluminum tubes that a toothpaste manufacturer had designed in the United States. This building we're looking at by Sir Joseph Paxton is basically a big greenhouse and it was built to house several things but one of them was the World's Fair uh, in the middle of the 19th century and so I'd like to talk about it first from a formal point of view and then talk about the, the sort of context surrounding the building because I think some of that's kind of interesting. First of all the thing is just humongous. It's uh, 450 feet uh, long. Uh, it was based more or less on the idea that they could make cast iron um, fittings that would be the ultimate frame and so a lot of the things were prefabricated off-site and then the cost of glass had gotten a little bit cheaper so they were able to make the glass and the material for it off-site and bring it together and put it almost together like Legos in a way it would, it would snap together. So what you might want to think about is that this building in a way was a precursor to trailer parks because you can make the components for trailers and cars uh, off-site and then bring them someplace and put them back together again. Uh, one of the major technological advances that were ha that happened uh, during the 19th century was Eli Whitney and his cotton gin and the interchangeable uh, machine parts that he made. He made pieces standard sizes and I'm sure this kind of ethos affected how architects were starting to think about architecture. Now the next thing that I want you to think about is the design of the actual building looks a little bit like a Roman triumphal arch and it also combines some uh, almost gothic components as well. So it's a combination of a whole bunch of artistic styles that's manufactured in a uh, very contemporary or modern kind of method and so what they're doing I think is still hanging on to some old antique ideas about what architecture should be. Interestingly enough, the building itself, when it was built, most people didn't consider it a work of architecture, they considered it a work of technology. The inside of the structure housed a whole bunch of exhibits. Um, it has, yeah, basically just, it was like a museum for technology, a museum for industrialization and some ethnographic components were involved with it as well. So just from the contextual point of view, um, Victoria and Albert basically designed a World's Fair that they wanted to teach people about good taste in a way and they wanted to show all the wonderful things that the British Empire and the rest of the world were accomplishing at this point in time through the Enlightenment science and, and through technological innovation. So one of the things that this had on it as a sort of uh, social change is that for instance when we were looking at impressionistic paintings like Manet and things like that when we looked at Manet's painting there's a lot of different fabrics and textiles involved in in the painting and one of the things that Queen Victoria and Albert kind of felt was not so cool was the fact that people used way too many designs or patterns together in one room and they wanted to teach people to tone it down because remember this is Victorian England. So one of the things was to teach good taste because industrialization made so much available that it even made a whole bunch of patterns and uh, pre-printed uh, material that people would just combine indiscriminately and apparently that sort of bugged the Victorian sensibility. The other thing that I think that the sort of World Expo at that time sort of brought to the forefront was ethnographic stuff and what I'm talking about is they would bring things back from New Guinea, New Zealand, uh, Africa and they exhibited these things and 
uh, a big deal in the 19th century was to have these things called curio cabinets in most people's houses where you would show things like a mummy's finger or a fossil or something that you had found uh, while you were traveling a, a chunk of a piece of antique architecture, stuff like that. And so there was a sort of interest almost in the tourist trade of, of visiting exotic places and looking at far off exotic people. And in some ways, this relates also to the movement that existed in the middle of the 19th century and the beginning of the 19th century called Orientalism. And the idea that you look at these exotic people and uh, you visit these places and they have a lot of commodities and things that you might be interested in. So those are the kinds of things that were exhibited in the Crystal Palace. The next work of architecture that we're going to look at is the Eiffel Tower. And this one, again, when it was built, people thought it was incredibly ugly. They didn't like it. Uh, there were actually a lot of Parisians were mobilizing after the World's Expo because this was another one built for international exposition. And the idea behind the Eiffel Tower was to show that they could build this incredibly large, tall structure very quickly and very easily using pre-manufactured kinds of things. So the tower itself uh, is made of pre-made cast iron and, and iron things, uh, steel structure, and then it was bolted together and the ornamentation on it, again, I want you to notice it has a series of graceful arches and ornamentations in which they're almost trying to emulate classical patterns from earlier periods. All of that extra crisscrossing and the archway, all of that stuff is really unnecessary because when you think about it, this is just a, an energy tower or a power tower that you might see on the side of the highway, but it's built to be even more beautiful. It has a little elevator in there. It also has a little restaurant on the platform and it because of the combination of the fact that it was such an incredible radio tower and, and the ornamentation on it was very beautiful for even for something that was made through industrial methods, I think that the Parisians finally decided that it was an icon and it also because it celebrates the French Revolution. Let me sell you a bridge. <laughs> uh, John Augustus Roebling and his son basically built this Brooklyn Bridge and it took a very long time to do. And it, there's a, a wonderful special, I think, available on Netflix for instant download on how the Brooklyn Bridge was built. And so we need to talk about it actually from a, a sort of more mechanical and formal point of view first. And then we can talk about some of the contextual stuff that was behind it. First of all, they had built a bridge spanning Kentucky and Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, and the way that they did it Roebling was experimenting with wires. I guess more properly, they're cables. And what they started having problems with, with um, large, large bridges going across wide spaces, is the fact that bridges that are built from solid materials like brick and stone, what can happen is there's these resonant vibrations that set up in the bridge, especially if horses are going across it or things that are generating a sort of rhythmic pattern of sound. And the bridges can literally shake themselves apart because they don't have any flexibility. What Roebling designed was really something that was just a, a really great innovation. He designed a series of twisted steel cables that were intertwined almost like a spider's web that went from these main large piers and they would be braided in with each other extremely strongly and then the bed of the actual road was suspended from that. So the bed of the road was built out of fairly flexible materials with this flexible cable system between it and what could happen then is the bridge could sway slightly and it could react to wind but compensate for itself and the vibrations uh, didn't shake the bridge apart it was part of the design that it had a certain kind of flex to it and a movement to it so these bridges are extremely stable but flexible at the same time and you might want to think about the Golden Gate Bridge as being the uh, the child of the Brooklyn Bridge as well the other thing that I think is uh, interesting about it architecturally, 
sort of like the other two structures we just looked at is there's a look back at traditional architecture. In this case, we have Gothic arches on these sm um, tall stone piers that were sunk hundreds and hundreds of feet into the water beneath and into the, uh, the bottom where they dug out foundations. Now, I guess we could move into a slightly contextual point of view where I tell you some stories a little bit about the construction of it because I think this is also very telling. One of the things that they were thinking of and didn't realize was that they needed to build a pier system that went deep enough down into the underwater and underneath the sort of sandy bottom and the muddy bottom to stabilize those piers that were sticking out of the water. So what they did was they had these big, almost cast iron bells that they could send down 10 to 15 people in in a series of sort of elevators that went down there and then they would dig up the bottom and then transport the stuff up. That's why it took from 1867 to 1883 to even get the piers kind of uh, set in there and then build on top of that. Unfortunately, one of the things that happened as they were sending people down in these bells is that when you come back up too quickly from too low a depth in water, the pressure causes a sort of differential in your blood pressure uh, and in the molecules in your blood and releases, I think, nitrogen or something like that, which gives you uh, a horrible case of what's called the bends, which is cramps and nausea and, and muscle spasms, and it can kill you. So it took a long time and a lot of people actually died working on this bridge as well. And so one of the other innovations technologically that you can't see is the development of understanding how to dig deep down piers underwater on bridges as well. The next structure we're going to look, about, look at, um, it's, it's sometimes referred to as the, uh, the National Library or the Bibliothèque uh, Nationale, but um, sometimes it's referred to as uh, Bibliothèque saint jean -Vieve. And it's uh, by Henri Le Brust. And what we're looking at is basically a lending library that was built. So I guess I'll approach it first from a, a contextual point of view, give you some background and some history. The library itself was a sort of extension or innovation on French thought that came from the revolutions in which there should be libraries that were popular lending libraries that everyone should have available to them to go in and, and read. And it was the idea that all citizens should be educated. So there was this social consciousness that's, that began in the 19th century, really in the 18th century at the end during the revolutions, in which common people have the right to certain kinds of things that would make them happy, and one of those things is education. So if you look at the exterior of the building from a sort of iconographic point of view, it still references academic architecture. It has a series of arches on the exterior there, these sort of classical uh, garlands along the outside. And in some ways it references some of the uh, buildings that we looked at from the Renaissance. The Palazzo Medici Riccardi and the Palazzo Rucciolai were two such buildings that had a very similar exterior. Where on the bottom level you have this rustication of a very heavy order of uh, stonework that's cut up very thickly and sort of blockily. And then as you move up, the orders get lighter and lighter until you get this almost sort of drawing on the exterior of the building at the top. And in some ways, you could even relate this somewhat to the Colosseum in Rome in terms of the design of the decoration on the exterior. But one of the things that's a lot like the Colosseum in some ways and much more like, for instance, the Palazzo Medici um, is that the exterior ornamentation is really just a facade. It really doesn't do anything for the interior of the building. What it is is basically just decoration to make it look like it's a classical structure in some ways. The interior of the building is also uh, really a technological marvel that relates somewhat to Sir Joseph Paxton and maybe even the Brooklyn Bridge a little bit. Because if you look at the interior of it, you have these cast iron sort of arches between these concrete arches. Uh, so the cast iron supports it almost like a Gothic ceiling might using masonry. But in this instance, they're using things that are cast off site. And then they have these columns that are these thin, long columns that are set on top of um, raised sort of uh, piloti in a way, a sort of um, base that's extended. And it's a very thin, elegant way of, of 
making a very almost inexpensive building using arches, which is wide open space, this sort of tunnel vaults through it. And the other thing that it does, like Gothic architecture, is it opens all the walls up to light because you're devoting a lot more of the support of the building is in a sort of metal skeleton that is actually kind of visible in the cast iron and the arches that run along the outside of the windows actually support an awful lot of weight as well on the exterior walls but the exterior walls don't quite support all of the weight of the structure because you have those columns running down the center almost like the the uh, nave of uh, of a gothic cathedral <laughs>